Hello, everyone, and welcome to this joint Market Links and AgriLinks webinar, Demystifying Market Systems Resilience. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, and I will be your facilitator today, so you'll hear my name or hear my voice periodically. As many of you have noticed, your main way to communicate today is through the chat box. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. We always love to see uh, familiar regulars coming back to these webinars, as well as new attendees. So please continue to introduce yourselves. And you are welcome to ask your questions anytime throughout the webinar in the chat box. We'll be collecting your questions, and we will do our best to answer as many of them as we can during the Q&A portion of the webinar, which will occur after the presentation. We are recording this webinar. And by virtue of attending today, you will be on the list to get a post-event email with the recording, the transcript, and several other post-event resources. So please keep your eyes open for that. And also, I wanted to call your attention to a few uh, downloadable files and links that are uh, at the, near the top of your screen, uh, recommended resources that will be mentioned throughout the webinar today. All right, so today we have Tatiana Polito and Kristen Oplanik from USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, who will be sharing what we mean by market systems resilience, why it matters for our programming, and what tools are currently available to support measurement. So I'll go ahead and briefly introduce our two speakers, and then I'll pass it over to them. So first up will be Kristen Oplanik, who is a market system specialist in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, where she seeks to advance market systems facilitation throughout the Feed the Future portfolio. And uh, she has worked in a variety of technical areas, including market systems, enterprise and livelihoods development, workforce, food security, agribusiness, rural finance, and sustainable tourism. And if you are a MarketLinks regular, you've probably heard Kristen's voice in the past uh, as a manager for the MarketLinks.org project, uh, and a previous facilitator for our webinars. And then we will have Tatiana Pulido, who is a Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning Specialist with USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, with over 10 years of experience leading issues in food security. And in her current position, she supports the design and implements innovation approaches to monitoring, evaluation, and learning, particularly leading the development of market systems measurement in resilience and food security. So I'm excited to pass the mic over to Kristen, and she'll take it away. Kristen? Deliberately considering our three lenses of competitiveness, inclusiveness, and resilience, the three things that we hope to enhance in the places where we engage. And we realized when we did that that we had pretty much nothing to assess market systems resilience. So it began a really interesting journey, which has involved many of you that have joined us today and has brought us here to try to catch everyone up with what we've been learning in those two years. That said, while the theory and tool development around market systems resilience has advanced over these two years, field use is still quite emergent, and we have so much yet to learn. We don't expect these first versions to be exactly right, but they do reflect what we know now. We had intended to wait for results from ongoing field research before having a community webinar on this topic, but in light of our current context with COVID-19, the need for understanding the theory and tools has become urgent. So here we are. While the intention of this body of work is that it's applied in our everyday operations prior to a shock, applying these concepts now will also help inform COVID-19 response such that our near-term actions can also serve to improve the long-term resilience of the market systems in which we are working. And please note that while Tatiana and I tend to use examples from the Feed the Future portfolio with which we work daily, these concepts can be applied in any market context. Okay, over to you, Tatiana. Great, thank you, Kristen. So what do we mean by market systems resilience? 
While there is no official USA definition for it, what you see on the slide is a working definition that speaks to the ability of a market system to draw on resources and solve problems in the face of a shock or stress. What's particularly interesting in market systems resilience is that while much emphasis is put on large, rapid onset shocks, such as extreme weather events, in current household and community resilience work, we are seeing initial indications that long-term stressors, such as HIV AIDS, corruption, or migration, can be just as disturbing for the market system. Ultimately, market system resilience is about managing risk to retain that market functionality for the benefit of our target populations. In most places we work, our best proxy to measure the market system is by using firms as the unit of analysis. That's because businesses tend to be the most sensitive to changes in the structures, relationships, and behaviors that govern the market. So by assessing how they interact and behave to changes in the system, we can understand not only the potential challenges to the efficiencies and inclusion in the market system, but also its fragility and thereby its resilience. One quick clarification point, however. While we use the firm as a proxy unit of analysis, market systems resilience is not about making each individual firm resilient. This is a critical difference from how we think about resilience at the household level, where we ideally want every household to sustainably escape poverty. But within a market system, we need firm entry and exit to maintain innovation and competition that contribute to a healthy market system. And so a key research question that we continue to grapple with is how to improve the resilience of a market system while recognizing that some firms should fail. Also, a final thought before I turn it back over to Kristen. Throughout our work in this area, it's really important to engage with our humanitarian colleagues on measuring market systems resilience and to be prepared for rapid monitoring in the event of a major shock, which I think we're all pretty aware of given our current situation. Over to you, Kristen. Great. So now that we have a sense of what market systems resilience means, why do we even care? First, we recognize that in the market systems where we work, risk is typically pushed onto the most vulnerable actor. For Tatiana and me specifically, that would be small-scale producers and small enterprises. This matters because we recognize that the resilience capacity at different levels is interlinked. The resilience of the household is linked to the resilience of the community and to the market system in which it engages. So if we're serious about improving resilience at the household level, we need to think about market systems resilience as well. As we engage with market systems, we should always be thinking about how we can help shift risk to actors better able to manage it. As an example, our Innova activity in Mozambique facilitated a new last mile distribution model for agricultural input. The model is based on regular fixed delivery routes to retailers based on catalog orders from a national distributor. In shifting the business model, the inventory holdings and their associated risk were moved from the more vulnerable small retailers back to the large national distributor who can better manage inventory risk and more easily access financing to support that inventory. So in this case, reaching the last mile smallholders and growing the input market was the primary goal, but the change also provided resilience benefits for the market system. So this is the kind of thinking that we're, we're really interested in. Now, let's address the elephant in the room for all of the economists and the complex systems, th complex systems experts that are joining us. Yes. Markets are inherently resilient, and that is why it is so hard for us to change them in the first place. As complex adaptive systems, they are constantly responding to a variety of stimuli and organizing and reorganizing accordingly. 
They ha always have been and they always will be. This is a neutral fact that is neither positive nor negative in how we think about market systems. However, we must be clear that for USAID and many other donors at this point, resilience has become a positive normative construct. So we need to be able to sit comfortably with the tension between that neutral quality of resilience in a complex system and this development concept that sees resilience capacities as supporting continued development progress even in the face of a disturbance. At the household level, preventing poverty backsliding, and at the systems level, protecting development gains. Essentially, we care how these resilience capacities can either mitigate the impact of a likely disturbance or shorten the recovery timeline with a view to development objectives. So note that there's a critical second piece to this when considering recovery post-disturbance, which is very relevant to us now. How that recovery happens matters as much, maybe more, than mitigating the impact. For example, we don't want power dynamics to shift to increase exclusion or extractive behaviors that cause harm to our populations of interest. We don't want the quality of products to deteriorate, like with food safety, further disadvantaging the poor. So this is important for us to be thinking about during recovery phase. So this brings us to this lovely illustration that we've borrowed, um, but it captures the idea of how this recovery phase could have very different trajectories depending on the capacities of the system, those three different red lines there in the green circle. So one day we'll refashion this image to, to similarly show different trajectories after the, after the disturbance depending on the absorptive capacities of the system. But I think you get the idea. So that when the disruptive event could happen, you know, there, there are different ways that that disruption uh, can ripple through the system. And then depending on the capacities, there are different ways that recovery can happen. So the whole idea behind the body of the work around market systems resilience is that the right system's capacities can dare I say, flatten the curve on the impact of the disturbance, and then enhance the curve on the recovery. So now let's take a look at the two pieces of official guidance uh, from USAID on this topic. And both of these are in the resources box at the top left of your screen. Note that there are other great tools out there as well, and we find them equally valid at this point. So we encourage you to peruse them all before deciding what is right for your situation. And at the end of this presentation, we'll point you to the page on Market Link where you can find everything that we know about. The first USAID piece, Guidance for Assessing Resilience in Market Systems, was led by USAID's Office of Food for Peace in collaboration with the Office for Foreign Disaster Assistance and the former Bureau for Food Security. The goal of this guidance was to provide an adaptable method, particularly for USAID missions, to begin to assess market systems resilience. It borrows from Mercy Corps' stress framework and is envisioned to support a decision process that will create parameters around which, market, around which market system, which target population, which likely risks, what critical market functions, et cetera, and illustrates each of these with case studies. So the intention is to hone down to what you really want to look at so that this idea of market systems resilience doesn't become an overwhelming analytical exercise. If you're trying to consider resilience to everything for every aspect of the market system, you'll never come to any answers. So while this guidance was written to maximize the use of secondary data, there are other ways the guidance could be used, such as with participatory workshops when we can one day do those again. And back to you, Tatiana. Great. So like Kristen said, the Food for Peace guidance helps hone thinking 
on market systems resilience to identify the resilience capacities that should be strengthened in the market system. So this brings us to the question of what are the determinants of market systems resilience. And alas, as with anything new, there really is no definitive list. Sorry, guys. What we did is we held a meeting back in around October 2019 with key stakeholders in the development and humanitarian sectors to discuss our experiences around market system resilience strengthening. At this meeting, we arrived at a general consensus on the determinants of market systems resilience, even though different tools have named or grouped them slightly differently. So to explain these determinants, let me use the naming and grouping example from Goals Resilience for Social Systems Framework, which is typically used to analyze the resilience of communities to disasters. In random order, the first determinant that we agreed upon was connectivity, which refers not only to the number or extent of connection among market actors, but also to the quality of the relationship. So for example, too much connectivity stagnates the system by stifling innovation. Too little connectivity creates fragility in the system as a single break in the connection weakens the system as a whole. Diversity refers to the amount of variation in risk profiles in the system. You can generally measure diversity in the system through the products, firm size, and markets, and marketing channels existing in that market system. Redundancy, the third determinant, is related to diversity. It speaks to the number and capacity of market actors to carry out system functions. You need enough redundancy in a system to allow for market functionality in the face of a shock or stress, but not too much redundancy that you then affect innovation, quality, or that functionality in the market system. Governance is the capacity of the market system to make decisions, allocate resources, and generally act as a whole to address the risk it faces. Participation speaks to the inclusive nature of the system. So does it include vulnerable groups, such as women, youth, persons with disability, or other indigenous and ethnic um, populations? And the final determinant uh, of market systems resilience that we generally agreed upon was tied to learning. And this refers to the way that the market system gathers information and makes new or maintains existing system organization. So a couple things to keep in mind here. First, more is not always better. You heard as I was going through the list of determinants that amplifying or dampening one of these can actually lead to greater fragility in the market system. Balance and context matter more than absolute measures as we don't know what the right answer is. And let me tell you, this makes measuring market systems anything really tricky. Second, and I really want to reiterate this point, is that this is not a definitive list of determinants. Kristen mentioned that we are at the early stages of learning from all our collective work on market systems development and resilience strengthening. This is but one of a handful of conceptually similar approaches to give you, our colleagues thinking and applying this work in the field, a reference point. So let me give you another example of a mental model. There's a second USAID guidance piece that was commissioned by USAID Kenya and the Center for Resilience back when we were under the Bureau for Food Security, and now it's under the Bureau for Resilience of Food Security. And this guidance piece explores market systems resilience determinants and theory of change measurement. This framework groups the determinants into either structural or behavioral categories. With behavior-related determinants, serving as a proxy to understand the rules and information flows of the system. You can see that the determinants, or characteristics, as they are called in this guidance piece, are similar to the ones I described previously. 
What is particularly interesting about this guidance piece is that the determinants sit along a continuum where they must be balanced to create what is they call in this guidance piece a proactive market system. And that is a market system that can neutralize or mitigate risk through innovation or problem solving. On the other end of the continuum, you can end up with a mix of determinants that lead to a reactive market system. And that is one that focuses on accumulating resources for a very narrowly defined identity group to withstand the shock or stress experienced by that market system. So once again, I want to emphasize that building market systems resilience is about finding that balance more than getting to an absolute number on any one of these determinants. What we're striving for in market systems resilience, what is described here as a proactive market system, is a system that can evolve new structural or behavioral patterns to manage risk, retain functions, and do so in a competitive and inclusive manner. Okay, great. So now that we talked about the concepts and guidance in broad stroke, we want to take a look at some practical examples that we've seen in this space that help translate these concepts into programming. Because as much as I'm sure we all find theory delightful, it, it doesn't make a difference unless it can impact the work on the ground. Um, so. This is an example of one that we, we think can be useful for designing activities or during implementation for work planning, for example. So um, at the Market Systems Symposium last year, Mercy Corps led this exercise that Tatiana and I adapted for some internal USAID sessions that we've done on this topic over the last several months. Uh, since we can't do a group exercise here and now, sadly, we wanted to share an example of the output from one of those sessions and maybe inspire you to try something similar with your teams or stakeholder groups in our current context. So in this exercise, you can you consider a specific market system, as you see here, livestock, a specific disturbance, here it's drought, uh, and then specific groups of market actors. So for, for this purpose, we did household, the small medium enterprise, and the government. But of course, you could make those market actors even more specific to, you know, again, if you're doing this work planning, you might have a specific ministry that you, you put there to, to think about. So then you think about the behaviors and strategies that those actors might use before a disturbance to help mitigate the impact, and then after the disturbance to recover and adapt. So you can note that this group put price gouging, it's kind of hidden there, um, but you can see it, as a potential response from small and medium enterprises, which is great because it is important to recognize that there are negative coping strategies. And again, remember that how recovery happens matters. So we definitely want to be paying attention to what potential negative coping strategies are so that we can think about how to help facilitate and steer market actors to more positive coping and recovery strategies. So we have one more from, from this exercise. Um, in this example, the group explored the fact that sometimes the shock can present positive business opportunities. So with price volatility, sometimes that works in your favor. And so what could be responses to that post-shock to really take advantage of that, that moment um, of a positive disturbance? So that's also something to bear in mind. Once all the ideas are brainstormed, it can be instructive to then think about how those ideas fit into the buckets of the different determinants that, for resilience that Tatiana was talking about. Um, and just pick a set to use from, from any of the guidance documents or, or um, different things that organizations have come up. It doesn't matter. Have a set of determinants and um, think about. You might find that most of the ideas you came up with are about connectivity and diversity, for example. Those seem to be ones we think of a lot. Then you could go back and think more deliberately about other determinants to fill the gaps 
for example, things about how the system is doing learning or participation or decision making. So with all of those potential behaviors and strategies in front of you, it becomes good fodder for more typical market systems facilitation thinking. Which actors have key levers they can pull? Which have incentives for change that you can work with? Who has the ability to amplify in the larger system? And so maybe that's an intervention point we should target. Um, but this way, it helps deliberately feed those ideas of resilient capacities into that thought process. Back to you, Tatiana. Great. So we've also seen these concepts and determinants used to understand the effects of shock and coping strategies of enterprises in the system. So for example, U.S. State Honduras' Transforming Market Systems Activity recently conducted a business resilience analysis to test a series of 10 hypotheses on the impact of COVID-19, our universal shock, on businesses' coping strategies and recovery aspirations. The study asked a series of questions via mobile phone to over 1,100 firms across 16 departments of Honduras that engage in about 17 different types of economic activities. This rapid assessment averaged 16 minutes for respondents to complete and took about one week in general to, to complete all 1,100 uh, surveys. It was conducted in the first week of April, and I believe there is a second round that should be happening right around now, mid-May. So I'd like to take a little point here, just as a putting my mouth specialist hat on, to say who who says that data collection needs to be owners. So if you want to know more about this, check out the blog post link on the left hand side of your screen. There's also this really great one page general reflection section about conducting these type of rapid surveys toward the end of that report, which is really great knowledge sharing. And finally, we also have with us participating Dunn Grover, who's the Mel Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning Director for Transforming Market Systems. So take advantage of this opportunity to ask him any specific questions related to this resource in the chat box uh, below. Another monitoring tool that uses these concepts and determinants that we talked about today is IDE's Market Systems Resilience Index developed for the UK aid and EU funded Uchana program in Northwest Bangladesh. This approach is more qualitative in nature. Each market resilience determinant is associated with a series of indicators or performance statements. And then using secondary data, academic research, and a workshop approach, which here at USAID sometimes we call a whole system in a room approach. Stakeholders evaluate each indicator or performance statement and give it a score. The scores for the indicators or performance statements associated with a determinant are combined to generate an index score for that determinant. I might have lost you, so let me unpack it a little bit more for you. So for example, one of the determinants that we talked about that affects market systems resilience is redundancy. A performance statement used to determine whether there is enough redundancy in Suchana's market system that they're working on asks whether there are multiple market actors providing input services. So through secondary data uh, analysis and review and this workshop consensus where all various stakeholders of the market system are in the room, this performance statement is discussed and then given a score. Then once all the indicators and performance statements associated with the redundancy determinant are discussed and scored, they are combined using a weighted average to create an overall index score for redundancy in the market system. The work is then conducted uh, on an annual basis to review and analyze um, and discuss these various indicators and um, performance statements to create uh, the index score for the determinant. And what's really neat about this tool as well is that they also use color coding for the various determinants so that you can easily visualize changes 
um, on an annual basis across the determinant. If you're interested in learning more about this tool, you can find the short paper uh, by clicking on the link in the web links box on your left. And we also have with us Chris Nicoletti, who's the Senior Director of Impact and Analytics at IDE. If you would like to pose any specific questions to him in the chat box about this specific tool. So finally, Kristen and I know that these are by no means an exhaustive list of all the efforts underway to measure market systems resilience. And we encourage you to share your work and experiences. Honestly, this was in part uh, our motivation in doing this webinar with you now. We know of a couple of upcoming uh, sharing events, or sharing efforts, or upcoming efforts, I should say. So over the next couple of weeks, RTI colleagues will be starting a market link blog series on their work measuring market systems resilience in Somalia. And MIT and George Washington University colleagues will also be sharing their work on rapid market systems assessments in the face of the COVID-19 shock using their system mapping methodology in Uganda. Actually, Courtney Blair and other team members um, from this work stream are with us too, uh, and they can post a link to their brief uh, on this work in the chat box right now. In general, though, you can find many of the resources that we discussed here in mar on Market Systems Resilience at the Market Systems Resilience resource page on Market Links under the Tools and Training section. Or, if you want, the direct link is also on the left-hand side of your screen, and you can just click on it now and then bookmark it. Kristen and I are always available for follow-up and eager to hear about your experiences in working on market systems development and strengthening market systems resilience. We're always only a short email away, and we really like to hear about uh, these efforts and uh, work with you all in uh, creating that general body of knowledge. So thank you for your time. Thank you for, for um, participating uh, with us today. And I'm going to turn it over then to Julie to help facilitate the discussion. Thanks so much, Kristen and Tatiana. And thank you to all of our participants for, uh, for of course, introducing yourselves and for posting some great questions in the chat box. We have a good amount of time now to dive into answering questions and to discussing these topics. Uh, so I think we'll go ahead and, and dive in. Let's see. So I'm going to start with <clears throat> a fairly uh, straightforward and blunt question posed by Gary on defining market systems resilience. And Gary says, the concepts and determinants make sense, but make for a very complex analytical framework. How is achieving market systems resilience any different from simply strengthening the market system? Is it essentially looking at broader production marketing systems rather than individual market chains, which maybe by definition uh, are more vulnerable? That is a great question. Um, and one that we have grappled with and been asked in every discussion <laughs> when we've talked about this. So wonderful. Um, I think the key is that if you take the three lenses of competitive, inclusive, and resilient as from a de development perspective, the, the ways in which we are trying to improve a market system um, for development outcomes, what we find is that when we think about more traditional ideas of, of market system strengthening, those tend to hew more towards sales um, and employment and growth from a more competitiveness uh, perspective. So if you, if you go ask a business and talk to them about, you know, what isn't working for them, what are their constraints, uh, they always give you those answers that, that really relate more towards those competitiveness aspects. You know, access to finance, always. Um, <laughs> not finding the right workforce uh, with the right skills. We, we know all those answers already. Um, but if you go and ask them more specifically about, what do they see as their primary risk and make the conversation about risk, you get different answers. 
And this really kind of hit us over the head um, when we heard about some of the findings of doing this from, from the Honduras TMS project, uh, which is one of the first that really kind of had these deliberate conversations with businesses about risk and not about growth. And what you find is that businesses make very deliberate decisions vis-a-vis -vis risk that may actually hurt their competitiveness, but they find that making those decisions toward resilience matter more. And I'm sure we could find examples of this in our current context, too. So I think this is how we get to the idea that there is a difference if you are talking in generalities about improving the market system, particularly from a Western mental model. Um, we're always thinking about profits and growth. Um, and if you go in with a very deliberate risk lens, you find different things than you may have otherwise. And that is why we are parsing this out as a specific conversation, even though I think theoretically you're right. You know, all of these things fold up into the idea of a stronger, better market system. But until we pull them apart and think about them deliberately, we overlook them. You know, the same can be said about inclusion. I don't know if you have something to add to that, Tatiana. No, I think you hit it right on the head. I think it's really about um, remembering that this is resilience is one of three lenses by which we measure the health or look at the health of the market system. Great, thank you. Um, Tatiana, I thought I would ask a question to you from Peter Boone, who uh, noted that you were referring to the uh, Market Systems Resilience Unit of Focus being the firm. As you know, many of our USAID projects um, work, or work on the main focus group um, that we're trying to boost are informal smallholder farmers who may or may not be part of a producer group. Do you include these smallholders as part of your firm delineation? Yeah, Peter. So typically we don't include the smallholder farmer as a firm two ways. One, um, they're typically not included as an SME definition, and that's really kind of where we're drawing the cutoff point. The reason why is because we are finding through um, the work and the research that we do on resilience at household and community level resilience and the work that we do on market systems level resilience with firms and other enterprises that are probably higher up in the value chain or what have you, that there are different incentive structures um, that play into account in the decision-making structure. Um, of both the smallholder farmer and then others who are uh, firms or enterprises that are much more commercially oriented. And so that's where, generally speaking, in the research that we're doing and what I'm seeing um, come across you know, my inbox is how the delineation um, is occurring and why. Great, thank you. Um, I'll pose another question to you, Tatiana, that came in uh, during your portion of the presentation from Indra Klein, who had a question on the redundancy uh, aspect in the list of market system capabilities that you shared. Uh, what metrics were or are used to assess redundancy, and to what degree is action taken? Sure. And so here to like Don, um, Chris, others who've also implemented on this, please feel free to chime in the chat box too in terms of how you've thought about measuring redundancy. Um, and so really, I mean, it's very context specific. So a lot of what I've seen um, is looking at just the amount of actors at a very basic level, just looking at the amount of market system actors that carry out a specific function. Um, and then really grappling and through a subjective or qualitative assessment with key um, informant interviews or with other qualitative tools, trying to understand what the right fit is given the context. Um, so unfortunately, and there I can't give you like a this is the indicator or this is the methodology. I mean, part of what we're do why we're doing this here is because we want 
more people to share their experiences. Um, but at a very basic level, that's what we're seeing, where it's this combination of both understanding and mapping out a system to see how many uh, what we call cross-market functions actors we have, so how many you know um, input suppliers are in this particular system, how many retailers, so on and so forth. And then through context um, understanding and discussions with um, key market system actors and stakeholders coming to an understanding of whether this is the right balance, if there's too much, if there's too little, um, and then really piloting and experimenting with that. Everything here that, that we've talked about is really about just very nascent um, and just really trying to find that balance and, and trying to figure out how to, um, like what that, that correct uh, composition looks like for that given context. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see. A question came in from David, who asked about how financial services and microfinance institutions play a role. What are the potential trade-offs of focusing on credit for smallholder producers and middlemen to build market resilience? I mean, my, my response to that would be that it's really going to depend on your specific market context. And I think that's the key with so much of this. Um, and part of why we, we really were interested in um, the first piece of USAID guidance that we, we talked about to really kind of force some decision making around setting parameters um, and specificity of what you're looking at and what you're trying to change and for which target population. Because depending on how you set those parameters, I think the answer to that question could be completely different. Um, so given the specific situation and the goals that you are trying to achieve, that may be really important or less important. Um, and depending on the market, that may be something that, that isn't the, uh, the biggest constraint um, or problem, or it may be something that is a very critical leverage point. So that, that definitely gets an it depends response. I think Thanks, a lot of people are not going to be happy with this here because we don't, <laughs> like, we have, to, we have to emphasize we don't have the this is the answer. Um, it's really about, like, this is very new, and you all are doing a lot of work as well in sussing this out and figuring um, some of this out. Um, but we did want to provide you with this general framework of it looks like this is the direction that we're heading. It looks like this is the areas um, that are going to really play um, a, key, um, a, key, play a key role in developing or strengthening market systems resilience. And then now it's really about, like, let's generate and let's learn about like, the really like, specific nuances around the how, right? Um, so please don't be frustrated. I think we're all in this together. Um, and it really, it's, market systems development is really context specific, as Kristen reiterated. Uh, all right, we have a question from Lauren Wild who asked, where are we with discussions on the importance of social capital for household level resilience? And perhaps um, further explain what is meant by social capital in case anyone needs that. Um, OK, so household level resilience is the, the expertise of other colleagues of ours. <laughs> um, we have taken on the market systems level resilience. But I think we can definitively say uh, that we know social capital is very critical, a very critical capacity. Um, and there are different kinds of social capital depending on uh, if it's, I think the terminology is bonding or bridging, but I forget the exact definitions of those. Um, but it's basically about your social connectedness um, within community groups or familial groups or ethnic groups, and then social connectedness outside and across to, to other groups. And that both kinds matter, again, depending on the specificity of cultural context, place, depending on the type of shock that household ex is experiencing, depending on if the household is experiencing a shock that is 
uh, a covariate shock that affects everybody in the community, or if it's an idiosyncratic shock that affects only that household. Um, again, there's a lot of nuance there, um, but given that we are not the household level experts, I'll leave it at that, but we, we know for sure it matters a lot. Great, thanks, Kristen. And I happen to notice that Julie Noble um, asked whether we can share the chat box transcript because there's a lot of valuable resources and discussion going on. And yes, the chat box transcript is one of the post-event resources that you will get uh, in an email along with the full transcript of the audio of this webinar, the recording, and some other suggested resources. So you'll see that in your inbox um, to share with colleagues or look for yourself uh, in a week or two's time. OK, on to some additional questions. Um, I think an interesting question came in from Hi Watt, who asked, can someone predict resilience of a specific system to future identical shocks using the scores calculated from the determinants of market systems resilience? The short answer to that right now is no, we can't. But that is the ideal um, where we want to head to is to get enough understanding and knowledge about how the relationship between these various determinants to strengthening market system resilience uh, to be able to then kind of start looking at not just understanding the state of play, but then foresighting or, or you know, modeling out uh, hopefully, um, you know, the, the actual um, forecasting, I guess, of the actual mar resilience of that market system and ability to maintain that functionality. To be perfectly frank, I think there's still a lot of discussion as to whether that's even feasible, um, you know, at, at any level within resilience. Um, I think the work is still very much ongoing in terms of just trying to, to understand how these dynamics work and interplay given that particular context, but that's definitely something um, I think that would be ideal to have, but still I think very long-term, um, a long-term vision. Great, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, I also wanted to uh, pose a question from Sarah Ward, who asked something that is probably on many attendees' minds. Uh, she says that she would like to hear how market systems development projects are adapting right now to the current crisis from COVID-19, and if any of what you've shared today has been relevant or useful uh, for adapting. That is a great question. Um, and this is actually something we're interested in as well. <laughs> so please let us know. <laughs> um, we, we are hearing things from the field that, of course, um, I think the initial action, which was the right one, um, and the TMS example reflects that, is it was getting out and talking to, to the market actors, to your partners, um, as to what they're experiencing post-shock and how it's, it's impacting the way they work to then help formulate, okay, how do we make um, strategic shifts in our work plans and in our interventions to try to, to help address that? But again, there's this tricky line um, to, to, to consider of, you know, some of the businesses that will go out of business in, due to this shock uh, should, right, you know, in terms of a healthy business cycle. Um, but certainly not all of them should. You know, this, this shock is at a much larger level than the ones that we usually are thinking about when we do this. And the fact that it's global is very unusual because typically the shocks we consider might be regional in nature, um, but not beyond that. So there are a lot of unknowns given the global nature and the fact that every market system is being impacted somewhat similarly. Um, and trying to think through what does that mean for our response tactics has put us in, in a stance to very much need to learn as we go. Um, and I think that's okay. And so that's part of why we wanted to put this out, 
now as this topic in the hopes that some of these things will be useful as people start figuring out based on the assessment of the, the, their partners uh, where, where to go from here. Uh, but I can't say that we're seeing any uniform way forward at this point, but we're very interested in hearing what people are doing. And I'm sure folks in the chat box that are on the ground, uh, please feel free to, to respond to this question. If you've made some decisions about your, your own pivots, uh, do share. Thank you, Kristen. Um, let's see, going back a bit to, uh, to defining market systems resilience, from Mamadou Dabo, what is the difference between market for poor and market systems resilience? Tatiana, you want to take a first stab or you want me to? Uh, go for it. I can talk about it in terms of the, from the mouse standpoint. Yeah, so I mean, I think it depends. And again, uh, of the different resources that are out there, um, they're, they're pitched a bit differently. So this idea of how inclusion relates to resilience, I think is an, uh, one of the many areas we have for learning yet. Uh, there are definitely uh, approaches within this space that see the two as very much intertwined. Um, and of course, from a development perspective, we're always equally interested in inclusion as we are with resilience. Um, I think our current focus is try to, to, to try to put the idea of resilience at parity with inclusion and competitiveness so that we're always thinking about the three equally um, and understanding that there, there could be trade-offs between those three. I think we've definitely seen um, trade-offs between competitiveness and resilience. And, and again, Honduras had some nice concrete examples of that where firms took deliberate actions um, to avoid certain risks, but full well knowing it hurt their global competitiveness, you know, in the coffee sector, for example. Um, and so we know that there is the potential for these trade-offs, but we just don't know enough of about it yet to be clear if being resilient has some sort of negative impact on inclusion or if the two are so synergistic that they in enhancing both is mutually reinforcing. I think we definitely like that idea um, and there are a lot of um, thought leaders that, that believe that to be the case, but I don't know that we have any real evidence on that yet. Tatiana. Sure, so I'm do. let me talk this broad brushstroke because I've been doing a lot of um, work with, um, I think, the DCD who really kind of spearhead the uh, M4P approach. Uh, and just from a MAL perspective, um, a couple of just differences um, between the two approaches that we're doing. So this is market, yeah, M4P and Market systems development, I would say, because I tend to view market systems resilience as one of the three lenses by which we assess market systems development um, and the health of the market system. A key difference that I'm noticing is that there is um, like a much more direct use of the uh, uh, like a direct linear correlation or hypothesis that they develop and design between the actual intervention to um, Either be a, to a, like to the objective of increasing employment or income for that target population, um, and so they're looking at like a very like a results chain and using a lot of that just direct linear um, association and relationship in terms of understanding how to implement their interventions um, and measure that, that impact. I think with the way that we tend to think about market system development and where we have a lot of discussions around uh, in USAID is whether or not that's actually feasible given the properties of a complex system, which you know are emergent, meaning that we know that things add up um, and the different parts somehow influence the 
the overall structure and behavior of the system, but we're not necessarily sure if it's that linear um, or that clear cut. And so I think that's an area where we continue to, to engage or to think about um, in that way. And so from a, from a male perspective, it's, it's slightly, like it's a very, very small nuance in terms of the theory of change behind the market, markets for uh, making markets work for the poor versus um, the way that USAID um, is thinking about market systems development. And that being said, though, we exchange, I think, a lot of information across these two regardless of that theory of change because a lot of the tools, a lot of the methods, a lot of the approaches um, still lend themselves to, to, to sharing and, and, and um, to you know, to, to amplifying one approach versus versus with the other. Um, so they're slightly they're slightly minutely different, but there's still enough um, commonalities there that we very much see it as like um, collaborative work to to reach that overall goal and having an uh, the same overall goal. Great, very interesting. Thank you, Tatiana and Kristen. Let's see, and thanks to everyone who's posting your questions. A lot of really good questions coming in. Um, let's see, we've got um, another question from Gary, who asked, is there an inherent trade-off between market efficiency and resilience? For example, large firms can achieve efficiencies of scale, but then might leaving, or leave all their eggs in one marketing basket when there is a shock or disruption to the system. I, I would say yes. I think we we believe that to be the case based on what we know and, and what we've seen. And, and even if you talk to some of the big multinationals, you know, they, they recognize the need to not be fully efficient because of the risk that that presents for exactly the reason you state. Um, so if you talk to your Walmarts and such, they specifically build in redundancy into their supply chains because they know that one, one of those chains can be knocked out at any time by whatever, um, cyclone, you name it. Um, and so they, they do that purposefully to, and knowing that there's a trade-off, that they're going to be a little less efficient, you know, it's going to hurt their profit margins a little bit but that overall that trade-off is worth it to achieve the right balance, which gets back to what Tatiana has been talking about. This is about trying to, to find a balance um, in the market system such that, you know, and I, and I saw a comment about, you know, propping up things that should go away, which is exactly our point. There is a normal business cycle. There should be businesses that fail. There should be turnover. There should be innovation. There should be entry and exit. Absolutely. We do not want the idea of market systems resilience to hinder that. But it is more about thinking, how do we protect development progress that has been made over the last decade or more um, given that the size of certain disturbances is, is becoming greater or we're seeing these long-term stressors like out-migration just devastating economies. Um, and thinking through how do, we, how do we find that balance between maintaining the progress that's been made but still allowing for that natural cycle of, of creative destruction and innovation. Uh, and again, there's no perfect answer to that, but you need to remain cognizant of that tension. Thanks, Kristen. All right, a question from Julie Noble from IESC. In the exercise that you shared as an example in the presentation, you had three groups, smallholders, SMEs, and government. Uh, was there a reason that you did not include other groups, such as lead firms, buyers, input suppliers, financial institutions, and other key market systems actors? Yes. We only had 20 minutes to do the exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> and, and, and we were also, we, we deliberately left those buckets big, and I also saw some comments about, you know, like, for example, livestock sector is, probably too big to really be useful. 
I agree. Um, this was more of a training exercise to get people familiar with the concept. Um, and it wasn't an explicit kind of work planning exercise. So if you would adapt this for your work planning, please be much more specific than that. Um, and, <laughs> but we had, you know, people from countries all over, uh, a global audience together. Um, so we needed to be able to talk about, you know, a very neutral livestock sector with very neutral kind of actors that everybody could draw from their experiences. But uh, in doing this for kind of a work planning or specific project design situation, be much more specific. Great, thanks. Let's see. Um, so Chris Nicoletti asked, does USAID have intentions of drawing comparisons across contexts or markets using an MSR measurement approach? If so, how do you envision standardization to allow for these comparisons? And um, they note that they're asking us because they're asking themselves. Uh, not entirely sure how to do those comparisons. So the quick answer is no. We are nowhere near thinking about that um, or have even discussed that yet because, again, like it's so context specific and the work that we're doing is so um, Masons. And so what we're really trying to do here is build these resources and these tools and this um, um, approach to market systems resilience. One, as Kristen mentioned, because when we were looking back at all the work that USA had done around market systems development, this was one of those three lenses that um, didn't have a lot there. So we were like, oh gosh, like we really want to build that up. Um, but two, also um, really building um, building up the, the tool set from the ground up. And so if it comes to a point where we have we understand enough that we are able to have a tool or, or um, you know control for change or variability in the various contexts that we work in, perhaps, I mean perhaps, but in general I think overall and through the future and stuff like that, we try to just and I know I say this and then people take it with a grain of salt, but it is true as a mouth specialist. We try to then just look at individual country or individual context specifically in terms of measuring that progress against, benchmarking against themselves, basically, um, because it's just very hard to standardize um, this type of work across countries um, and then put some sort of subjective value in terms of progress or not um, across countries given just how context specific this work is. So we, Nick, um, or Chris, we haven't, um, we haven't um, really touched that or even discussed anything like that. We're very much just at the beginning in terms of trying to build these resources and tools up, and then hopefully as a community come to an agreement and consensus in terms of what really makes sense and at what level does standardization make sense um, for measuring um, market systems resilience. Thanks, Tatiana. All right, a question from Anna Wamash. From a strategic and business viewpoint, don't you think that looking at the market system nodes in, make, in part makes more strategic sense than assessing the whole market system? Tatiana, you want to take that one? <laughs> sure. Um, I think yes and no. I think one of the things I would also ask Anna there is just going back to this research question that we grapple with, if we really focus on the node, and for me the node is really the unit, right, uh, or the actor, um, you know, some of them like in a market are supposed to fail. Some firms, let's say, are supposed to fail. And so how do we grapple with understanding um, and incorporating that aspect of uh, the health of a market system with um, with just them focusing on the nodes. Because again, we're not really trying to amplify or ensure that every node um, is functioning to its maximum cap uh, capacity because part of the, I guess, um, 
overall health of that system would be um, that some of those nodes would need to disappear. Um, and so that's been, I think that's what I was trying to allude to earlier on in the presentation of that's been a bit tricky to understand, like when is that normal and when is that not. Um, and then the other thing too is also trying to take a step back and understand the market system comes from a place where there is a theory around complex adaptive systems about emergent behaviors that arise at a system level um, that if you study just the individual node, you will miss. And so there are behaviors and other characteristics and structures that occur naturally that don't have a one-to-one -one relationship with the actual components of, um, let's say, that, com that complex system, such as a market system. Um, and that's also the part where we, at, like in USAID, are really trying to like suss out and understand if, if that that theory applies to market systems development as a complex system. Um, does it not? And that's a lot of to what I was alluding to earlier with um, uh, trying to answer Mamadi's question that there's that slight nuance and difference between the way that uh, M4P and the DCD tend to view working in market systems development space and the way that we do it. They, they believe that, yes, you can. Um, if you just work with a node and, and enhance, uh, enhance that ability, then that, that, will, that benefit will be replicated and trickle out um, and create a, a, a response to then improve the market system. Uh, and we're saying that mm, it might not be that, that clear cut and that direct. Great, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, we have, let's see, about 10 or so more minutes left for questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. But since I know that some of you may need to drop off, I thought we could bring up our ending poll so that anyone who may need to depart can provide us some feedback uh, before we finish the webinar. And um, so we've got three polls there in the middle of your screen. Um, so please let us know uh, what you need, what more you need to be able to apply these concepts to your programming, uh, and the other two questions as well. All right, let's see. Um, an interesting question from Michelle McNabb. How does the likelihood of multiple layered shocks in 2020, for example, COVID and cyclone in Bangladesh, COVID and locusts in East Africa, et cetera, require us to alter our analytical processes or priorities for market systems resilience? Or does the global covariant shock of COVID make it an outlier that skews future analysis? Well, I'll give a general answer, and then I'll let Tatiana get, get uh, specific with the M&E perspective. <laughs> um, this is such an important question. I'm so glad you asked it. Um, and I would say it's not it's an important question regardless of COVID because in, in many, many cases, the market system is facing layered shocks and stresses, especially the stresses. And I, you know, this is something Tatiana mentioned kind of back at the beginning, but before COVID, things we were finding from people in initial uh, forays of this work uh, was that the stresses seemed to matter more to business outcomes than, than the more rapid onset shock. So we definitely don't want to forget about those. Uh, and so you will, I think, in, inevitably have layering in any context. Now the question is layering of what? Um, and how exactly to, to navigate that, I think, is kind of the next step of this. So in in all of the exercises and discussions that we've done thus far, for simplicity, we have focused on one shock or stress at a time to, to have people really think around those. Um, but particularly within the current crisis, I think that you know, teams are just going to really have to, <laughs> to stretch, stretch their capacities and, and very purposely think about. Um, you know, COVID-19 and locusts, and what, how do those two things come together, and how do different market actors respond to those things simultaneously, recognizing that there may be responses that are specific to one thing um, and not relevant to the other, 
but that they will be managing both of those at the same time. So I think we need to be doing that. I can't say we have examples of that yet. Um, done, Chris, if you've got something in the chat box to add um, it, where, where you may have done some things like that. But from more of a, a learning training exercise perspective, um, we've always just stuck with looking at one thing at a time um, just to really help, help people move forward. But the reality of how this needs to be implemented is likely going to be in a layered shock and stress situation. Tatiana? So from a male perspective, the COVID situation to me is a covariate shock, um, albeit one that is an outlier because we are experiencing it at a global level. Um, and so then the kind of the impact of it is that much more um, greater, right? Uh, so in terms of like the tools that we would use to assess the impact and the per aspirations or coping strategies of individual groups um, or units of analysis that we would be interested in, um, that I think a lot of the, the work that we had done beforehand can be adapted to um, get that type of information regardless of what shock we're talking about whether it's COVID or, or something else. Um, I think where I'm starting to see a lot of changes and, um, you know, appropriately so, given this particular shock is in the method and the, the way that we're collecting it, right? And so if you take a look at um, uh, USAID Honduras' is transforming um, market systems uh, business resilience analysis uh, report at the very end, that one page that I referenced that has just some, some reflections, I guess, on just in general, how things are pivoting in, in, in the space to, to assess this information. Um, what I'm seeing is obviously a lot more um, rapid assessments, a lot quicker um, turnaround time from when you um, collect this information and when you make it available because we're having to keep um, and really prioritize the real-time nature of this particular shock. Um, because it's so, so specific, right? Um, and then obviously the way that we're collecting that information. And so really having to hone down on like the critical questions that are um, necessary to understand all of the um, impacts that this has and being able to do that remotely, be it through mobile phone surveys um, or other remote um, um, assessment tools. Um, so that's really where I'm starting to see changes in this. And I think, in general, it's going to be really interesting um, after we, you know, get our feet under us a little bit more um, as a community to come back and reflect on this experience in terms of doing rapid assessments and collecting information um, for this particular shock and see where we come out with in terms of what was most useful um, in those processes and what could have been improved. Um, and I'm thinking that I'm thinking that the, a lot of the discussion is going to revolve around like needing these quick, 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 quick feedback loops and the frequency by which we need to be con collecting this information and updating this information. And at what point do we stop? Um, and so I think a lot of the what we're experiencing now um, is going to be really good um, um, reflection, pause and reflect inserting CLA here, uh, a really good pause and reflection moment um, later on as we, once we get our, our, our feet under us. Thanks, Tatiana. Um, I think it's pretty clear that we need to find or continue to have some great venues for continuing the conversation here because we've had so many great questions and comments in the chat box. And we weren't able to answer all of them today. Um, but I think there's value. We'll definitely be taking a look at them uh, and uh, continuing the conversation as much as we can. Let's see. I think that we will have one, or what I'll do is ask one more audience question, and then we'll have some final wrap-up words for those of you can, who can stay a few more minutes. And so our last question for right now is from Russ Webster. How can we, going forward, reframe this discussion 
market systems resilience to make it less theoretical and more operational. Russ, we love that. Um, <laughs> and this is always what we're trying to do and a bit why we didn't want to have this webinar quite yet because we wanted more robust operational examples. Um, but again, COVID-19 has kind of forced our hand. Um, <laughs> so I think that part, part of that is for us to ironically move away from talking about resilience and talk more and more about risk and specific probable risk. Now, COVID-19 makes that interesting because we probably would have not put that in anyone's probable category, but here we are. Um, so I, I think that as people take these concepts and move them into the operational space, talking more and more about risk and less about the concept of resilience really helps make that operational shift. Because when you talk to a business about its risk, they have concrete things to tell you. When you look at data about past shocks and stresses in the environment and how those play out into different risk scenarios, that gives you some like clear parameters to, to work within. So I think that that is one way to really move this into a more operational space. Of course, today we were very much in the theoretical space. Um, and we, like Tatiana said, there are things going on in the field that are continuing even in the face of COVID. There are more things happening because of COVID. Um, and so we're really hoping to draw all of that operational learning out. Um, we always have planned to have a, some sort of learning event in the fall to pull together these, these operational learnings. And hopefully, COVID-19 permitting, we will be able to get together for a large event to really dig into, into that operational learning and advance from the theory. So that is certainly our intention. Tatiana, anything to add? Nope, you said it. Great, thank you both so much. Uh, so just in terms of, of final final point, yeah. I, I want to reiterate, I feel like much of this audience was our, our development um, colleagues. I definitely saw a few humanitarians in there. Um, but again, reminder that please, you know, we might be talking a lot to our humanitarian colleagues right now because of COVID, but it's not necessarily something we do in, in a normal time and space, but we should be in terms of thinking about risk and thinking about recovery and what they have learned from really being on the front line of that for so long. It really can help inform what we're doing. Um, and then also bearing in mind that while we need to build those connections with them and the understanding and coordination and communication, we are not asking our development assistance partners to become humanitarians. Um, that is not your expertise and we don't want to pull you away from the development things that you are doing, but we want you to inform the development things that you are doing by this consideration of risk and, and what it means for your development activities. And when you are operating in a post-shock space, to bear that in mind, um, that doesn't mean that post-shock, now we want you to just make grants to a whole lot of businesses because you are trying to play humanitarian to help them survive. Um, you might need to do some strategic things of that nature for certain leverage points in the system, but we still want you to approach things as a development actor with a development lens informed by the humanitarian perspective, if that, if that makes sense. Um, and, of course, we are... We are wading our way forward um, and learning so much as we go in this, but maintain that, um, that strategic perspective uh, as you do this. Um, and Tatiana, any final remarks from you? Just two. One, to remember that market systems resilience is one lens of three, including inclusion and competitive that we use to measure the health of a market system, right? So keep that in mind as you're developing systems or, assess it or assessments, right, that it is one component of three, so you don't want to create an overly complicated, um, time-intensive 
approach to assessing and measuring and implementing this one aspect of a much greater um, development objective that we have in strengthening um, the health of the market system. And then just really encouraging you all um, to keep sharing your experiences through market links um, with Kristen and myself. I think the more and more that we're able to, to pool these resources and build um, this, this approach and the toolkit uh, together, the more effective uh, it will be. Wonderful. Thank you so much to you both. And thank you to our participants for your rich participation in the webinar today. Just a couple of quick, quick announcements before we wrap up. Um, join Market Links on June 4th for a USAID webinar on, keep, on keeping firms and supply chains afloat in the age of COVID-19. This webinar will share challenges that USAID and partners are facing during this pandemic, and speakers from the field will discuss how they are reorienting programming. So keep your eyes on your email for that. And also, AgriLinks is planning actually three webinars in June. There's been a lot of uh, uptick in demand for webinars lately, as you might imagine. So AgriLinks will be covering seed systems, fall armyworm, and market-based ag technology scaling. Those have not been announced yet, but that's the plan. So if you're on the AgriLinks mailing list, you will get those announcements as well. Um, and then also uh, sometime in the fall, we are also expecting to share some research findings from the field using the methods that you uh, learned about today. So thank you all very much for joining. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you on future Market Links and AgriLinks webinars. Take care.